that look like they would be interested in the kind of piece that you've got. <coughs> you then, they all have contact, you know, on their, on their website, and you then send them a lovely, short, cold email. It's easy to do. I'm terrible at cold calls, by the way, but I can send an email to anybody. And this is what I, this is what I did. I would send them a note um, saying, introducing myself, hello, you know, I'm a composer in the Los Angeles area, which is where I was at the time. And uh, I, I really enjoy perusing your website, and I, I think particularly, you know, the Beethoven sounds absolutely beautiful. You know, make some comment that makes it clear that you actually have spent time on their site. I am so opposed to mass mailings and faceless communications. I, I mean, I just hate them. I think they're pointless. And I, I get those, we all get those, and I also get the people who've taken time, you know, to, 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 to communicate to me as a person, as, as an individual, and that, those are the ones that get my attention. Um, so you say something personal that's true about, that you believe, about something on their site, and you say, you know, I was perusing your repertoire and I wanted to let you know that I've, I've got a piece for uh, your instrumentation that I would love to show you. Um, here is a link to where you can hear a couple of audio excerpts from it and see a couple of pages of the score. Yeah. Okay. On my website, there's the works page, which takes you directly to my catalog of concert works. Imagine that. And you scroll down and browse my music and see how I've got it. So let's go to the trio. And here's the trio for clarinet, violin, and piano. This is a very early piece for me. So I click on this, and this brings me directly to, as any of these would, they're all direct links, because here all you have is the basic information. What's the instrumentation? What's, what year was it written, and how long is it? That's really the basic stuff that people need to know, but they need to know a lot more if they're interested. So they click, and up comes a little ferret tree, a lemur trio, I think it is. Um, <laughs> But uh, up comes all the publishing information, and what's, what else is related to it, you know, there's a little piece that was made from it, and a recording, so I can click there, and it takes you to the, record, the commercial recording of the piece. Um, oops, sorry. Um, if you have any, if anybody said anything about it, or if it's won anything, you can add that. Here's the description, the program note of the piece. Here is where you can see pages and hear excerpts. Here's where you can buy it. Hello. How much, how much of an excerpt do you do? I do, um, these excerpts are about probably a minute and a half each from a 12 minute piece. So, you know, I just give them enough to hang their hat on so they can really get a good sense of the piece. Some excerpts, I mean, I, I'm sure I have some three minute excerpts up there and I've got some, you know, 30 second excerpts. It's whatever you need to get the pieces. So are you, like, let's say you have the start to finish piece, are you doing the well, in this case, three. I have one from one each movement. It's a three-movement piece. But you're right. Sometimes I've got start to finish ten-minute pieces, and I'll do maybe two or even three short excerpts from different parts of the piece. But because you, the music sounds so different. But you, you, let's say your piece is consecutive and it builds in one half or whatever. Do you do you take <coughs> a bit from the beginning, a bit from the middle, a bit from the end? Yeah. Or do you just play them the intro kind of thing. Oh no, I'll take a little bit. If it's a significant piece that really has big mood changes and, and big changes in it. Um, I'll take a piece from the beginning and I'll call it, you know, beginning and then I'll say later, <laughs> like earlier, later, I'll call it. Um, and same thing, I don't know what I have here. This is an old one, this is a very old piece, but anyway, I have the title being the first page of the Allegro, and then I've got a page from the second movement, and I've got a page from the third movement. Um, sometimes with, with basic pieces, you know, I'll just take two or three pages that look interesting out of, out of the piece. It doesn't even have to be the first page. Um, but you get the idea. And basically, this is the link right here, up here. That's the link that I include in the email after I've said hello, introduced myself, said that I really enjoyed their work and that and I have a piece that would be of interest to them. It's a short, sweet, and professional email. There's nothing apologetic about it. I'm not saying, oh, I'm sorry to bother you. I don't want to waste your time. You know, but, and I'm also not being arrogant about, you know, I, I have this great piece that I know you're going to be interested in. You know, don't do that. <laughs> you know, there's just, there's just a, a very nice way that you can reach out to anybody in the world. And, and um, that's, uh, that's what they would get. And so what I found, I discovered this 
completely, no one taught me how to do this. I just sort of backed into it. And what I discovered, this was back in 1999, 2000, um, people would click. It's amazing. People, you put a, a friendly little note and a link to something, and they, nine out of 10 times they would click, and seven out of 10 times they would buy the piece. Wow, because this gets back to the money thing. I'm not being paid to, I wasn't paid to write the piece, but then you go here to, to buy, and click, and they buy, and it takes you to activist music, yay! And, uh, and then they can, uh, and then they can purchase it. So, um, that is um, one of the many ways to use your website to reach, to get more performances as an unknown quantity, and to get more performances and reach out to show people what it is you do. But the most important thing on that on that web page was the recording. Because just seeing the score pages might not have done it for them, but it comes alive when they can click and listen to what your piece sounds like. Suddenly they say, oh yeah, this, I like this. You know, it sounds like that bar talk we did last week or whatever. Yeah. And then, um, and then, they're, and then they're, 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 there they go. Also, another option you have is, I, I, there's nothing wrong with doing this. You can offer to send it to them, PDF. I mean, if you can avoid sending scores and incurring those expenses, that's better. Um, but feel free to be generous and just say, you know, if you, if my trio for clarinet, violin, and piano might, might, uh, might be of interest to your ensemble. If it is, I'd be, it would be a delight to send you a link to the PDF files for download. Just let me know. And I wish you the best for your performance season. Uh, you guys sound terrific. You know, some just nice, charming thing, and off you go. And so, in that case, I'm not saying they have to buy it. Because in fact, thank you. I'm not saying they have to buy it. You know, because to me, I don't know how much that piece sells for 30 bucks probably. The relationship, we're getting back to that, the relationship to me is worth more than the 30 bucks. That, because that relationship, they are, let's say it's a wonderful trio in Berlin, and you know, they're gonna do this if they do it, or that it's gonna get some very nice um, exposure. That's worth 30 bucks to me. It's a lot cheaper than a ticket to um, plane to Berlin. You have to think like a mensch, I love that word. You got to think like a person always about these things. Don't think about the, the petty amounts of money. Even though we all like that, and I listen, I petty amounts of money come into me for my scores, and I am very happy for that when those come in. But don't think, don't be penny pinching about grasping for the the little thirty dollars when you, what you really want is the thirty thousand dollars worth of everything that happens in the future because somebody, and this has happened to me many times, somebody, to that piece that you gave to the ensemble, well somebody heard that, decided to record it, and then uh, somebody else heard that recording and then decided to commission you for $20,000. You know, um, this is how it works. So the small term thing of selling your score for 10 bucks, 20 bucks, 30 bucks, that, you, you know, you can afford to give that away because that's not going to pay your rent anyway. If you choose to, I mean, it's it's up there. Obviously, I do a lot of score sales. I'm, I'm I'm just saying that there's a balance. That there's plenty of stuff that you should be happy to also graciously give away when you're contacting somebody. When you're taking the initiative to contact them, as opposed to them contacting you, in which case it's totally appropriate for them to pay for the score. But it's very appropriate if you choose to to offer to give them a score. So that goes right into the, and it's probably too soon in your talk, but the copyright, because yeah, you can give it away for the 30 bucks, but you're not giving them a score to use indiscriminately, you know, and, and, and not. Well, you are. I mean, in a sense, if you're giving them the, the PDFs, they're gonna use, they're gonna do it, but what you say is, um, if you perform the piece, I, you know, please let me know, et cetera, and then maybe even you drop a follow-up note to them, or you Google, you set up, here's another little thing, set up Google alerts for your name, in parentheses, because that's at least two words probably, unless you're Cher, and Cher is not in the room. Um, your name in parentheses, so it stays together, Alex and Shapiro, and every piece in your catalog, also in parentheses if it's more than one word. And set up Google Alerts. Google has this thing, which means anytime the search bots come across a <coughs> combination, you get a notice about it. And it's remarkable about how many things you find out about. I find out about performances all over the world, radio broadcasts, all kinds of stuff because of this, because I get these alerts. That's a great idea. Yeah. The, the, uh, one of the things that um, university composers, students face all the time uh, at, at um, state universities, I'm not talking about big conservatories, is 
Well, a post audio, they have a live performance of students at their institution. It's less than what we want. Right. And then we also know that there are many files we can send, you know, like Sibelius sounds, lower level, or we could have east west sounds, or we could have Vienna sounds for, for a mini performance. Do you have a rule of thumb or advice on which way to go? But, well, if, if possible, both. Are you talking about enhancing the recording or using a MIDI instead of a, of a live performance? In, of a live yeah, using a MIDI instead of a, I, a I live have, performance. I have a lot of thoughts on that. Yeah. Back to my days of before, this is very relevant to the computer. Before I had a lot of live recordings of music that I was furiously, fast and furiously, I wasn't actually furious, I was very happy. But as I was fast and furiously writing all this stuff, I didn't have live performances of most of it, but I did have top grade samples, and I, again, remember the way I said everybody here, here needs to have the audio editing stuff? Well, it, uh, it is immensely helpful to have uh, a sample library, a very good sample library, and a, and a sequencing program. Um, I use Digital Performer and a host of sample libraries so that you can do two things. One, when you're starting out and you don't have any recording at all, you can create a very good and listenable, not crap, not general MIDI, frightening, horrible sound, because that will turn anybody off in two seconds. No matter how brilliant your piece is, it will, you, no one is going to do it if you give them No, 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 never. Stop, you know, even on judging panels, I'm telling you, we don't, it's like nobody has the patience for that. So you, it's very important if you do a MIDI, which I do recommend, do it with really good samples that you take the time to enhance. That means, you know, an instrument that does not have a fast attack. You know, it, most instruments, instruments like a wind instrument, doesn't necessarily on the slow legato line go, which is what it would if you triggered it, right? No, an instrument goes, right? And so you, you, you can edit that. You can edit that. It just takes time. And that's what I would do in my earlier days. And I had an advantage coming from the commercial music world, but anybody can do it, and I think everybody should. Put a little studio together a little on your laptop so that you can create very convincing, listenable samples, a sample realizations. I won awards. I, my double bass sonata won an award uh, based on the sample realization. I'm not even sure if they realized that it was a sample. I mean, I got a great sample, and I worked very hard to make it sound realistic, and I put reverb, the right amount of reverb on it, and the right this, and the right that, and it won an award from the International Society of Bases. How cool is that, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like the thing had never been performed, and it got a really nice review from them, too. So that was with the MIDI. A number of my things were, were uh, done with MIDI, with good, good sounding MIDI. Um, my tuba sonata, uh, Music for Tubic Instruments, which went on to be recorded by the great Alan Baer, who's the principal of New York Phil, and it was commissioned by Norm Pearson, who's the principal of uh, LA Phil. Um, uh, that I did a really good mock-up of that tuba sonata, and boy, that, even before Alan's recording got out, that got, that got out a lot. So I totally recommend it. Now, there's a step B about why I recommend the samples. This is the nefarious CD underbelly. There's nothing bad about it. But when you get a recording that is okay, but let's say you're a very important pianist in the ensemble, kept forgetting to like hit that low octave that is really necessary to make the music harmonically make sense vertically in this very important passage, right? That low B flat octave is just gone. Or, or the mic didn't pick it up or they just didn't hit it like whatever. Or you know, or or countless situations where something's just missing. Or the balance is off. I get a band recording and you know, the, the, for some reason, I just cannot hear the bassoon at all because of the way the acoustics were in the hall and the way that crappy MP3 that they sent me turned out. Well, what do you do? <laughs> you put the audio file into your sequencing program with, with your sample library up already, and you find the closest sample to the actual sound of the instrument that you need to fill in there. And you also match the reverb and, you know, the ambiance, the ambient, um, sound of it, and you plug it in, and you record it along. You play along music minus eighty. You know, you play along with your own piece, and you and you can add the little nuances that are missing, or enhance a few. If the double bass is, you can kind of hear it, but you don't really hear it enough, and you know it in real life, it would be heard more. You don't want to 
you know, enhance it in a way where it's not going to sound like that in real life. But if something's missing, you can use your sample setup, your sequencing setup, to put those notes in very convincingly, mix, them, mix it all together, you turn those notes into audio, and then you mix, you bounce the audio together, and voila, you've got a much better sounding demo that sounds actually much more like the piece that you uh, just wrote. That is a great reason to have a studio. I've done that countless times. Um, as I, I was saying before, I think before you came in, that one of the things I've, I've also done, um, and the musicians are always fine, but I've never had anybody say no, because it, it makes everybody sound better. I can speed things up or slow things down a little bit. I can, you know, something that just isn't working right, I can edit it. And, or I did, this is my, the story I want to tell you before, because it just cracked me up at least. I don't know if it's going to crack you up. But the U.S. Army Strings is among the nation's best orchestras. I mean, they are just awesome. And they did a premiere of a piece of mine, a very slow elegy uh, called Remembrance in, in, uh, in uh, August. Gorgeous performance. Flawless. I mean, beyond, like, I was chilled when I listened to this. I couldn't believe it. And um, so, you know, they sent me an MP3. Wouldn't you know it? The right, right on a rather important down, downbeat or second beat or third beat, whatever it was, it must have been the fourth beat. Now I remember. Right on a beat, fortunately, somebody lets out in the Church of the Epiphany in Washington D.C. This big resonant church, Kachu, <laughs> like right in the very quiet, you know, section. And I'm thinking, and there have been other clicks and clacks that I was able to edit out into, throughout the piece of live performance, clicks and clacks that were a little distracting. And I was able to edit them out. I get to the big kachu, and I'm going, oh shit, I can't, I can't unkachu that kachu. You know, even the best software is not, I can lessen it a little bit, but I can't do much about it. I was very lucky. The kachu happened on a, on a beat, right? On a beat. Like, uh, it started on the upbeat of beat four, and <coughs> beat four was the main kachu, and the tail out was done of the kachu, the resonance of the kachu was done by, the, by beat one of the next measure in the four four bar. Okay? Couldn't have been luckier. I could not have planned the sneeze better. <laughs> I listened to the music, and I would never do this if I were the engineer and it was your piece. No, 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 I couldn't do this. But since I'm not only the engineer, but I'm the composer, I listen to the music and I think, you know, I don't need that beat. And I, I swear to God, I edited it out perfectly. The entire beat, I, I, I right pre kachu and right post kachu, perfect. <laughs> I got that slice of that one beat. I knit the two parts together, the two ends perfectly. I listen to the music and I'm thinking, you know what? That's an improvement. It didn't need that extra beat. That was going on too long in the tooth. It goes one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three. Now, much better. <laughs> and, and I thank you now for that sneeze. But that is a great illustration of how cool it is to have the tools at hand to be able to do that kind of stuff. Because I'm not only, you know, that was the only place where I actually took out a beat, but sometimes you get a little click, and what you do is, you know, you can just edit out. You guys know this who do this. You can just edit out that little click. No one's going to miss that millisecond that goes by. You just take it out and knit the pieces together, and you're good. And just make sure there's no digital click of where you're, you know, making your cut, making your splice. So these are the tools. Real life composers do this. Um, I'm a little geekier than most. I mean, you know, I, 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 but I think it's, these are my favorite tools and I think they, they're incredibly helpful for all of you to know how to do this stuff. Um, do you so, feel obligated when, like when you remove a beat from yeah. these? Do you feel obligated then if you, if you post on your website to inform? Oh, I changed the score to reflect it. No, no, no. no. Oh, I see. I that. changed the score. I, I, I should have added that. I removed the beat, happy with the recording, and then I went back into my score, which I published, and so it made it very easy to do this. Oh. And I took the beat out. I just changed it in Sibelius. And now no one is any of the wiser. The only people that will have ever performed it with that fourth beat are the U.S. Army strings in that <laughs> one performance. <laughs> So, I mean, this is a great thing. Now, we, and we can talk about publishing now. I mean, let's, let's just wrap up the preparedness thing. There's a lot of stuff that you want to just be at the ready with. Recordings being at the top of the list, and your scores and parts being next. Scores and parts with really great page turns, really legible, and um, there's a lot, and, the, and, and this leads us into publishing. Oh, God, it's already 10 after 2. We should take a lunch break, break maybe. At some point, when you wait, you do you want to keep going for a little bit, or do you want a break, or do you want? I have a question. Yeah. Um, with 
the activism music stuff and all these the links mm -hmm. um, and sort of like the professional web page. Did you do the page yourself? I do all the programming and, myself. Um, are you going to touch on that later and like how to get sure. into that? Sure. I mean, I'll make it easier for you because I mean, I did this old school in Dreamweaver because in 19, when I started my website in 99, 2000, that's what you used because there was no WordPress. But now I tell everybody to get a WordPress site. A, it's free, and B, it's really groovy. You know, it's very web point, three point Which one? W WordPress. Oh. WordPress.org. If you're starting up a site, I recommend WordPress. And my blog is in WordPress, actually. Um, but what I do with my site, which is in Dreamweaver, is I make it as interactive as possible. <coughs> Um, on the home page, for instance, let me just, just, just give you a very quick rundown. <laughs> We're jumping all over the place, but it's fine. There is no reason. Anyway, so very important. Have a picture of yourself looking friendly, okay? No scowling allowed. If I see one more scowling composer <laughs> picture that looks like the composer's going to slip their wrists <laughs> if, if, they, if their music doesn't get performed right to their specifications, I'm just, I mean, I hate it. Be friendly. <laughs> it attracts people who want to play, play your music. So be friendly. So please put a picture. Please put lots of pictures. I nothing bugs me more than when I go to a website that doesn't have any pictures, or and certainly one that doesn't have a picture of a composer or a musician. That drives me insane. So immediately, what do I do? I put social media, you know, up here. I make it easy for them to search for something. So if, if they are looking for, you know, ocarina music, they, which I don't have, they'll find that out quickly. But if they're looking for anything else, you know, they just type it right in there and they can search. That's a free service from Google. Uh, all the pictures, of course, are, are my photos, you know, Samuel Islands and yada yada. Um, I feature my blog because I want people to go to it. And look at that. Here I am at Western. So that's like I put in reverse chronicle in chronological order what's going on. So I have a thing of what's going on. All these things are clickable. Everything leads to links of what's going on um, at these different places. And then a picture. And then here's some highlights of some other stuff that I did. Oh, see, I was at Western again. And then, there's remembrance with the with the with the fourth beat that is no longer there. Um, the Happy U.S. Army Springs beat. Um, a new piece. Notice every piece has an MP3 that people can listen to, and of course everything links to its own page. So if you go to Tight Squeeze, you know, click on that, it's going to take you right here. This is a new <coughs> piece of mine. Um, so it takes you right to the piece, and the piece shows you the instrumentation, its band. And here's the consortium, see that? So the consortium gets thanked always, everywhere. Um, these people all join me. And here's some links to the library. <coughs> Set of notes for people interested, interested in doing it. A nice article about it. Uh, the score, and notice here, very important, email Alex for code access. This is the quid pro quo of the database. I'm very happy for anybody to take a look at my band score. No one's going to perform the piece without the parts, you know. Um, but what I want from them, they don't have to pay for it. How Le you know, Hal Leonard wants everybody to pay for the crucial scores. But if they contact me, they can have it for free. Um, but what I get is, a not only do I get their email address, that's the least of it. I get a chance to respond to them in a very friendly and nice email. Thanks so much for contacting me. I'm really glad you're interested in the piece. And uh, you know, and I'll say I'll I'll have probably googled them and seen what they're up to, and I'll probably refer to it in something conversationally, or you know, it's because chances are it's somebody we don't know. And anyway, I start a rapport with them, and I send them the thing, and and, and I say you know, and I show them how you know if you're interested in it, um, you know, you can buy it through me or through Hal Leonard because that's one that Hal Leonard is the exclusive uh, distributor of, on up whatever. So it gives me a chance to engage. Every time somebody has to email me for something. Um, they're engaging with me and I get a chance to engage with them. And that gives me that much more of a chance to we wheedle my way into their heart, you know, to make them just need to have my music. And you too. It's, the, it's no different for any of you guys. So here on this page, this is a long page because it's a band piece. So here's the program note. I squeeze might best be described by the following suggestion. So. Who do you buy all your website hosting from? Uh, I use Pear.com Pear for 20 bucks a month. For how many? 
Uh, oh, 15 gig, 15 gigs or something. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I'm sorry, our time is up. <laughs> Let's go to the video clip. Um, I, I, a lot of games, I mean, because it's a pretty big site. No, but I mean, um, you have multiple websites, it sounds like. Oh, no, oh, well, I do, but it's, it's all hosted. You can have as many as you want. They don't charge for a website. They're just charging for an account, basically. $20 a month? Yeah, I think it's 20 a month. What is it? Uh, Pair.com, P-A-I-R.com. Oh, okay. You'll get it. Anyway. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Anyway, um, but you see what I was doing there. I'm, I'm using email as a way to stay in touch with people. And I do this. Um, let me give you a, a, another poignant example of connectivity. A, a lot of the stuff that I do these days, I'd say, you know, a third of the chamber, well, a quarter of the chamber music and most of the band music is electroacoustic. I just like doing that. And um, which is sort of an unusual thing in the band world, and so it's been really fun to, to start this new genre. And when I, I, I discovered sort of by accident that the best way to make a lot of friends with a lot of band directors is to meet, is to find a reason for them to have to be in touch with you. And one of the best reasons is they need access to the track, the click track and the accompaniment track. No longer do we enclose CDs, physical CDs, with scores. Those days are gone. I used to do that, and I'm glad they're over. Um, now everything is a link. And so when they buy the score, either from me or from Hal Leonard in this case, um, they buy the score. And in the score, in the front page, it says, you know, for, to download the, um, uh, the accompaniment track, please send a friendly email to hello at activistmusic.com. I think that's what it says, something like that. Or download at activistmusic.com. So they send me a friendly email, and I send them a friendly email back with the um, uh, with the link, and they are now in my database as somebody from. And I have all their information. Usually, band directors always have signatures at the bottom of their you know thing of what school they're with or what organization. And obviously, I've got their email address, and I put in my database as I described before. You know, I type in what piece they just bought, tight squeeze or whatever, and I put them into a little subcategory in my address book called concert. Uh, I mean, um, concert band, or wind band conductor, no, whatever I call them, band directors or something. Concert wind band directors. Anyway, they all go into that. And that is my fodder for funding the next piece. Because, you know, some of my commissions come to me where people come to me and they give me money and they say, please write this for us. And others come because I know I have some people who are interested, but none of them have enough money to do it. And I can say, oh, no problem. I, you know, like I've got this one right now with the high school band piece where there's some people are ready to go, but it's not gonna be enough money to fund it yet. And so, no problem. Let me contact a bunch of people in my database. It took me, it took me one day to fund Tight Squeeze. One day, I mean, one day, like two seconds to write the email and send it out to people, and then within one day I had a response from everybody. So how much, like just for as an example, how much did that? That was about eight thousand dollars for a three-minute piece. And each person contributed how much? Uh, between fifteen hundred and five hundred. It was a little different depending, but that worked out well, you know. And that was one, an email, a personal email that I sent to the, the top, you know, seven, ten, whatever <coughs> directors saying um, that had read that I knew liked paper cut and that I had um, another piece I'd done that they knew about and that I had a lot of contact with these. So I just took the most likely ones. Boom. That's how to do it. And that's the consortium model is so great for us as composers. The other thing I want to say, for those of us who write pop music as well, how many of you guys are songwriters as well? Yeah, me too. Uh, although I don't, you know, I haven't been trying to fling myself into that field recently. But we are so lucky in the concert music world, believe it or not, because we get paid up front, 50% up front to, to uh, you know, for our work once you get the commissions coming in. You get paid before you have even thought of the first note. And then you get paid more when you deliver it, and sometimes you get paid in between, depending on the size of the commission and, and your contract terms. Songwriters, as we all know, are writing everything on spec, because gone are the days of studios, you know, recording studios, Given us lots of money to just you know be on staff, write great things for great performers, and pay for our albums. It doesn't work like that anymore. The system is totally different 
than what it used to be. So we're very lucky in the concert music world that we, we're doing the best of anybody financially in terms of our business structure. Think about that. We, are, we have a great business structure. Somebody wants a piece, great, you know, let's put it together. I put together the funding, the commitments, the, the checks come in immediately. Wow, that's groovy. I can pay my rent. You know, that's really a wonderful thing. So uh, these are, this is, I'm not saying that this is how everybody here has to do business, but it has worked for me really well. And I haven't heard anybody else talking about this in this way. And I think it's so important to share this information with my colleagues, which is you guys. Uh, that you can, if you have to be entrepreneurial these days, I, I know you all know this, to have a career in anything, really, anything self-employed. You have to be entrepreneurial. And you have to think outside the box. And you have to pretty much ignore, frankly, the way things used to be done. Because very little of that is relevant. And um, the publishing world, as, as you probably already know, is really upside down. I mean, the major publishers certainly are still there. But we are now in a world where it's fully expected that you will be self-publishing. And that your odds of doing well with self-publishing are actually much higher um, than, than your odds of A, being signed by a major publisher, and B, making notable money with a major publisher, even if you are signed. I'd like to share a story here. Please. Yes. I was in Atlanta, I guess it must have been two years ago now, two, two and a half years ago, and I talked to uh, Busy Rocks publisher. They were there for this, it was an orchestra convention, the uh, League of American Orchestras <coughs> convention. And they said that they, they were, it took them at least a year or more now to respond to the companies and sent their scores out. So I said, okay, I'll, 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 I can accept that. So I sent them some scores. I haven't sent them scores in the past. I sent them some scores. It's been two years now. Wow. I have had no response. Have you even, have, did you follow up at all? No, yeah. no, I haven't followed up. But not even, not even that we have received your scores, thank yeah. you, we'll get back to you. Yeah. yeah. Now the guy at Busy and Hawks told me that they were very embarrassed about this. I'm sure, and I'm sure he meant that. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I think that's that's the problem. That is in fact, and and that's actually that is, and this is somebody that you met when you were there, and it was yes. a personal contact too, yes. which is even we exchanged cards. Yeah, yeah. So there you have it. And listen, being an entrepreneur and running your own business, it, a publishing deal works this way: you're going to pretty much they get your copyright for the piece, uh, which is your your biggest asset. Because think about it this way, one of the income streams, oh, let's play, let's play the game, what are the income streams? One of the income streams is um, um, sync licensing. What sync licensing is, is any time your music is used to picture. Let's say, uh, you know, Ford Cars wants to use a snippet of your music for their commercial. You could stand to make a lot of money from that. Uh, or, a, or a movie decides to license a song of yours. That's a lot of money that can really. What's well, it called? S C. Sync. S Y N S Y N C. Sometimes with an H too. Uh, a sync license, synchronization license, and um, you want <laughs> ideally, if you hold if you hold the copyright, that means you also, you know, get all the advantages, not just some of them from from ancillary licenses. Um, with a publishing deal, they own the copyright. The standard deal is ninety percent of the uh, sales goes to the publisher and 10% goes to you. And that's not a lot of money, especially if you're talking about a score that sells for 40 bucks. You know, you get four bucks on that. 10% um, goes to you. Now the publisher, in exchange, is supposed to give you good promotion on the piece, et cetera, et cetera. But we all know that that tends not to happen, except for the biggest and biggest of names. Usually it's sort of, you're the flavor of the month for a month or two, and then that's it. They don't really do much for you. And that's, it's a very, um, it's a very frustrating uh, business model. They will, they do take up the slack in terms of doing the actual printing. Uh, so you don't have to do that, which is a pain in the butt, all the printing and preparing of the scores. They will do that. They will, they'll be your copyist often. I know a number of publishers will do that. They take over the, the copying and they'll, of course, do the printing and the binding and the, and, the, and the commerce of it. So for a composer, and there are plenty of us out there who don't want to do all the stuff that I'm talking about doing. You, know, you don't want to have to be the one-man circus 
for one woman so just you're just tired it's, it's, it's exhausting you really would like to have someone else do all this well then uh, you might it, it very well might suit you very well to have a publisher have a publishing company represent your work and take care of all this stuff but the flip side is you're not going to benefit financially from it you'll get other things you'll get the um, the, the benefit of the PR if the publisher does a good job and gets the piece out there the um, the uh, flip side to this, oh, and by the way, I should say that with rentals, score rentals, usually like an orchestral score rental, you get 50% on the rental, is pretty much the standard, as I understand it. Um, so 90 10 on sales and 50 50 on rentals. Now, conversely, in self publishing, you get the joy of being a hat rack because you are wearing so many hats simultaneously <laughs> of, you know, not only writing the music, but you know, copying it, preparing it. If it's if it's electroacoustic, you know, you're in some way you're an engineer and a, and a record producer as well. Um, you're doing the PR for it. You're doing a lot of this. It's but of course you get 100% of of the sales. And if you can do a good job of getting those pieces out the door, you know, that will mean something to you. When my money comes through a PayPal account, is I have a PayPal shopping cart set up on my website, and that's how I get it. So it's really nice to wake up in the morning, you know, with the you know. You've got money notification in your email box. That's great. Before I've ever sent out the score, you know, it's talk about faith. They, you know, they send you the money, hoping that you know this strange composer person is actually going to send me the music. So, um, yes. I was wondering why this ninety percent to ten percent on sales. You got me because they because they're doing they're investing the um, the money in engraving it and you know public printing it. Up.